Welcome to Forward Obsessed, where we talk to breakthrough business leaders and rising entrepreneurs about their journeys, origin stories, and aha moments. Hello and welcome to the episode 40 of Forward Obsessed. I'm your co-host, David Salinas. In today's episode, we had Chris Redlitz join us. What an incredible story. From his early beginnings where he bucked all the trends, he was a rebellious young man who would go on to sail without technology, GPS, from California to Hawaii and back. Go on to be a ski bum, start a shoe store, become an ultra marathon runner. Go on to work for Reebok and see them go from 10 million to $4 billion. He would then go into the tech space, starting multiple companies with exits and failures. He would go on to start a nonprofit organization called The Last Mile, where their focus is to end recidivism, re-entry back into prisons for incarcerated individuals by teaching them technologies and getting them into six-figure jobs. This is an incredible journey that this man has been on with his wife, Beverly, who is quite the character. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome back to episode 40 of Forward Obsessed. I'm your host, Pete Senna. I got Dave Salinas as always. And today's guest, Chris Redlitz. Really excited to have you on the show, Chris. Thanks for having me. So as we always do in classic Forward Obsessed territory, we always start from the beginning. We're always looking for where does entrepreneurship begin? And we found so many different places where entrepreneurship pops up. Take us through your childhood. Like, where did it come from? Well, interesting. We're in Connecticut now. Uh, I was born in Putnam. And uh, we moved when I was eight years old. My dad got promoted to California, to Southern California, and uh, in his in his company. And uh, we, I never forget, it was January of 1965, and I'm dating myself. It was stormy. We get in the car. I'm one of three, youngest of three. We get in our Pontiac, pack it up, and we leave Connecticut. And I didn't come back for 22 years because we got to California and it was 75 degrees when we got there. We live right near the water. It was during, you know, Beach Boys era, surfing USA. And I completely adopted that immediately. <laughs> so skateboard, surfboard, sailing, that became my passion immediately. So I went from, you know, being born in the East Coast and thinking I'm going to skate the rest of my life to actually, you know, being on the water. So that was really the, 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 the um, sort of introduction to that as a young kid. And we've moved back since. I never thought I'd move back to California ever, but we moved back two years ago because of family during COVID. So here we are living in Connecticut. Um, and ironically, my brother went to Yale as well. So we went to Yale in the early 70s. That's a whole another story. But um, here we are back in Connecticut. That's how awesome. so your father was promoted. What kind of company was he in? He was, uh, he was, in, um, he was an engineer. He had a variety of things, but they did um, small... Uh, milled parts for computers, mm -hmm. um, you know, pre, even pre-computers at the point at that point. So it was electronic hardware is what he sold. Uh, and, you know, he went to University of Rhode, Rhode Island, yeah. you know, East Coast guy. Um, my, my parents are very academic oriented. Mm -hmm. He went to uh, 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 URI and in, in studied engineering. My mom went to Penn State and she became a teacher. Okay. So my mom is 102 today, still alive, God and she her. graduated from Penn State in 1943. Oh. So very much into academics, very much into music, and um, I have two older brothers. As I said my oldest went to to oldest brother went to Yale. Mm -hmm. um, my other brother went to to Cal and became an architect. And I was completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. Did not want to get into academics. Didn't care about that. And I think that's sort of these. You know, my path has been very sort of counter to what was expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I didn't want to come east. I never went even want to visit my brother when he was on the East Coast. So, um, you know, that's kind of the early path. Yeah, 75 and sunny every day. Yeah, beats, forget it. Yeah. Beats the four seasons. That's it. Yeah. Although you got to deal with the earthquakes. Did you have, where were you in Cali? Uh, Southern California. We were okay. in a place called Palos Verdes, which is south of L.A. Okay. Experienced smog experienced yeah. earthquakes yeah fires uh well fires weren't so big then Back fires there, yeah. have gotten obviously a big issue today yeah yeah but um at the time you know as you're when you're an eight-year-old yeah and you grow up you don't you know you just roll with those kind of things yeah 
um, because you're at the beach every day and you're the water every day and whatever, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, that was sort of the path. And, you know, I was very into sports. Um, all of us took uh, classical piano and uh, that was boring to me. So when I got in high school, I started playing the clarinet sax. Okay. And that led to me being in a rock and roll band. Nice. Uh, and I also played sports when I was in, in school. My family wasn't really you know, oriented towards sports at all. So mm-hmm. that was counter to what uh, kind of they were focused on. And I wasn't a good student, mm-hmm. to be honest, because it wasn't really a priority for me. And it used to frustrate the shit out of my parents Mm-hmm. As my brother, my oldest brother was, you know, he was president of the school. He was, you know, uh, I think he was admitted to almost every Ivy League school that he applied to. Wow. And uh, that was just not for me. Yeah. My path was different. Yeah. And as it turns out, it worked out okay. Yeah. I mean, we're going to get to it. And I mean, we, we already know the end of the story, but the, <laughs> for the for the listeners and the people that are watching, then th- this is very true. Yes. Um, it's funny how the dynamics are. I'm one of three. I'm a middle child, so I have a completely different story to tell. And I think, and my wife is one of three, and I look at her little brother and sort of how he was, and he was a little bit more rebellious and took a different path. And um, very, very capable guy, very smart, very intelligent, but, you know, went to college, then he wanted to be a Marine, he went to officer candidate school, and did did it a completely different path. And I think there's a trend there where it's like, okay, the youngest... You have all the experience and all the wisdom above you, but you chose to go an entirely different path and Completely. sort of, yeah, go against the grain and see what happens. Rebellious is a is a good label for for kind of how I approach things for sure. Still to this day, yeah, I think so. I mean, going against the grain um, and doing things that are not normal, yeah, sort of in, even in business, mm-hmm. um, looking at um, sort of grit as opposed to pedigree, mm-hmm. right? Those are things that have been sort of mantras for me. Mm-hmm. And also everything that I've done, I've gone all in on, mm-hmm. you know? So, you know, I, I went to college to please my parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, I dropped out after two years. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, I grew up on the water. So one of the things I wanted to do was do open ocean sailing. So 20 years old, dropped out of college. Um, and uh, me and two others uh, sailed from Ventura in California to Hawaii. Oh, wow. And at the time, this was, you know, 1975. No. So there's no GPS. No, 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 very yeah. little. Wow. So you you learn how to navigate with a sextant. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, the risk there is, is pretty significant. So yeah. I don't think if my kids wanted to do that, I'm not sure if I would have approved it. But yeah. my dad really sort of, I think he saw the... the sort of the, the journey and, and the, um, you know, he was a sailor, but never really stepped out. So he's mm-hmm. kind of living through that, I think a little bit, mm-hmm. but, uh, so I did that and Plus went to Hawaii. Plus if he he had the two good ones. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> good point. I'd never thought about that, but <laughs> he's you like, have I got a the big point. Yeah, we're good to yeah, go. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I did that and, um, lived with Hawaii for a while and, um, ended up sailing back and my parents said, okay. Now we're good. You went back and forth to Hawaii. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's incredible. That yeah. is awesome. I mean, that's incredible by today's standards, but yeah. with all the tech we have today, but back then, it was a lot, whole lot harder, I'd imagine. Well, so you know, it's interesting. So you were 19? I was 20. 20, 20 years, years old? Yeah. Wow. So um, the guy I sailed with Al Sarkarov was, he was a um, navigator on several Transpac, so he was very proficient, but, you know, he was 56 years old. So it's like, you know, what happens if, if he's not around, I mean, you think about this kind of stuff because you're on the water for three weeks and when you don't, when you can't do, um, you know, a, a horizon shot, which you have to do in a, with a sextant, you do something called dead reckoning mm-hmm. where you just kind of estimate where you're going. Right. Yeah. And, uh, we would go days and days without really knowing where we're going. And he was so good that when you, I still have the chart today, it's on my wall, our nav chart. Mm-hmm. And you see that he was off just slightly. This is how talented he was. Wow. But you think about it, you, you sail 2,500 miles and you hit a little dot in the ocean, which is Oahu. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's pretty incredible. You think about it, now today we have all these, you know, GPS and everything where it's not really a challenge. Then mm-hmm. it was. What was that moment like when you saw land? Well, so we we landed actually was, now I, I take it back, it was 1976 because we landed the night of the bicentennial. Wow. Yes. So all these, we, li- we landed at night. And um, when, you, when you navigate through to uh, 
the Yacht Harbor in Oahu, it's very tight. So there's a lot of buoys around there and so forth. But the rockets are going off. And it's like, this is the greatest welcome event ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's for us. We've arrived. <laughs> but you know, it's crazy is because when you don't walk for three weeks yeah. and then you get off a boat, oh, it yeah. takes you a couple of days to really acclimate. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, I've been on a boat for a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> Take, takes a couple, it takes a while. Yeah. 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 You sea legs, they call it, right? Sea legs, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think I've never been seasick. Yeah. So I think that's just one of those things that um, you adapt to. Like, I loved it, you know, and the crazier the weather was, the more exciting it was to me. So, how many people were on the, on the, just three of us. Wow. Yeah. So, what do you do? Is someone, someone's always up? Yeah. Got yeah. it. Yeah. So, take shifts and you sleep in little hammocks. Are you fishing to eat or did you bring food? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We always, uh, you know, we trolled Troll. and yeah. we get uh, tuna, we got mai mai, we got some sailfish. Nice. So, because we didn't have a refri- refrigeration. Yeah. 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 So, you shouldn't eat. You, and I was the cook, so you just cut out the belly, fry it up, or make ceviche. Yeah. Yeah. That's good That's good eating. It is. Yeah. That's There's that. nothing like having it. Just put it on the fryer like minutes after you catch it. Nothing like it. Did you journal or anything to capture like your thoughts throughout the three I did. Weeks? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Not as much as I should have. Yeah. But I did. Took a lot of pictures. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you look back and you think, that's pretty crazy. But for me at the time, it wasn't that crazy. Yeah. Because I said, like, I was all in. I just wanted to do this so badly. Was there any gnarly, like, weather, like, where you thought, like, holy shit, this is going to... Yeah, what happens is when you come back, you have to go catch the northern trade winds. So you have to go as as far north as you can. And, you know, you're kind of at the Washington-Oregon border. Mm-hmm. And that's where it gets kind of crazy because uh, that's much more turbulence. So yeah. we were in near-gale conditions we would be bare sticks with just no no sails, yeah. and you're still you know going pretty quick. Um, but the interesting thing is that when we did, did our shakedowns, which is where you test all of it, um, we were close to Point Conception in Santa Barbara, and that's where the northern and southern trades meet, mm-hmm. and that's some of the the worst conditions. So it's the best place to test your equipment. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm hearing a trend here, which is it sounds like throughout your career and your journey and your life you have had a knack for navigating uncertainty and certainly like that literal sailing uh, that story that you just told, um, I think plays to the obsession that you've described as something we've seen in your journey right? and also ambiguity, right? Like you mentioned, like having to do that dead reckoning thing, which I hadn't heard that term, but I played the video game Um, and navigate a a sextant and all these things. Like I I think of that as a technologist myself and going, wow, like I'm getting anxiety just hearing this story from you (laughs) and that ambiguity. It sounds like, your parents were both into academia you know, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and academics was something that, you know, clearly you didn't follow that. Cause yeah. you, what I'm curious about is, so where did the rebellious spirit come from? Was it just, you wanted to do the direct opposite that your brother did, or was it something different entirely? I think it was a lot that I think when you, when you have a sort of close age of brothers, there's an expectation and the first one sort of sets the tone. And that was really what my dad was also very in tune to that, like academics, my brother was in the Whiff and Poos, which is a singing group and and a very well known in at Yale. So he was he was sort of living all of that, right? And um, you know, when you have to follow that, it's there's high expectations. But also, like I knew there was something different, even at that that age, there was something different than I wanted to do, right? Um, I wanted to do things that were, you know, not the norm, and <clears throat> so. I think that was part of it. You know, it's, and, and once you do a little bit of that and get a taste of it, then you want more and more and more. So I mentioned, you know, I sailed to Hawaii, came back, and my parents thought, oh, you know, he's got that out of his system. Then I said, um, I'm going to immerse myself in skiing, so I'm going to go be a ski bum. Mm. So I ended up doing that, went to Alta, Utah, and uh, for that season, after I got back from Hawaii, I lived there. And uh, worked in a place called Alpen Glow Inn, which is a sort of a mid mountain uh, restaurant, and skied every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because again, that was something that was a passion for me. And where else to hone that than doing it? And, you know, I didn't have any responsibilities, right? Um, we got paid $75 a month, we got um, free room and board. And at the end of the month, I still had the 75 bucks because you get a free pass. So, you basically have one day you ski, full day, and then half days every other day. 
I mean, as a 20 year old guy, it's, you know, that's best pretty, life ever. Pretty yeah. sweet, right? <clears throat> the good thing is that the, the folks that owned that restaurant, they only took people that were taking a year off from college because they didn't want to perpetuate the ski bum thing. Mm. So it, that actually turned out well because I may have stayed longer, but they said, no, 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 your turn is <laughs> over, dude. You need to leave. So I'm, um, I'm seeing this thing where like uh, a good buddy of mine's a musician and an engineer. He's done a lot of work in tech. And he always says to me, there's levels to this shit is what he, is what he said. Yeah. And I'm reminded of a Spinal Tap reference is like turn it to 11, right? Yep. It was past the point. What I'm hearing, whether it's sailing at 20 or going all in on skiing, you have this tendency, what I'm hearing is that when you do something, there's 100% and then there's what Chris does. Yep. And is that a fair assessment for everything you do? Very fair. I think people that know me and work with me understand that. And also you have to, um, ha you know, you have to also set the expectation of others, right? Because you can't expect people to have the same, you know, what people call it work ethic or commitment or whatever it is, right? And uh, so I think that's part of it. Understanding that this is something that you do all out. People could talk about passion or commitment or whatever it may be, but also balance it realizing that, you know, you can't expect that same, you know, situation for people around you as well. Yeah. I want to talk about your leadership principles later on this show, but before yeah. we do that, yeah. how's your body? Does it hurt? Well, it, it, so, <laughs> Sorry, I just have to get... so, so here's what happens. So I come back from skiing. Um, I had a great time gained about 20 pounds. And uh, when I was growing up in Palos Verdes, there's a very well-known marathon called the Palos Verdes Marathon. And it used to go by my house and I wasn't into running at all. Um, but to get in shape, I said, I'm going to run the marathon. And uh, so I started training and I started training, you know, sort of all out. I, I didn't know pace or anything. So I ran that first marathon. I broke four hours, which supposedly is good. Right at for the your time. first marathon, no, that's pretty damn good. Um, and so I got addicted to it, became an endurance athlete. And uh, when I actually did finish school, when I was 25, I opened up a uh, running store in Hermosa Beach, California, because I was so into you know, running endurance sports that I thought, well, if I have you know a store, then I can live this thing every day, and that's what I did. So um, that actually led to me starting work for Reebok. Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> so it was early, like um, it was 1982. I had the store. Um, a friend of mine was one of the first uh, reps for Reebok. And Reebok at the time was a running shoe company. Sure. So he said, dude, I need to sell this. Nobody's buying it. You need to to put my shoe, you know, our shoes in your store. And I did. And one of the first shipments that they sent, all the, the soles delaminated. Oh, man. So it almost put the company out of business, but he, but because I had this friendship with this guy, um, and we were running partners, uh, I said, you know, I'll stay with it. They ended up, you know, replacing the shoes and within the next year and a half, the shit hit the fan and Reebok just started taking off. So we said, I need help. Would you work with me? So I did, kept the store, ended up moving it into a mall in Manhattan Beach and uh, started working for Reebok as a road rep, just uh, going to events, going to um, you know fitness studios because the 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 first aerobic shoe was was introduced then the freestyle aerobic shoe, which is still one of the top selling shoes of all time. So my job was they gave me a van with a Reebok on the side, and I'd go around and give away shoes. It was a great deal. Um, and then I got more and more and I got involved in, uh, sales and marketing and I ended up working for the company for 11 years. Uh, and during that time, it's one of the biggest success stories of the eighties where we went from, you know, I think at the time it was between 10 and $15 million in sales to when I left, it was 4 billion. Wow. And we went uh, public in 86 and Sarah, I'm a young guy working with my friends. All of us were runners and endurance sports guys. And, you know, we're working, but it's really not a job. Sure. And we've got the hottest brand in the market. Um, so I did that for 11 years and it never felt like work. How did you balance that between your own store and Reebok? I have to imagine, like, back to commitment, imagine it was very difficult at that stage in your journey to be able to do both. Yeah, uh, it was, but they were both doing well, right? And so I would be on the road during the week and then I work in the stores during the weekend. 
Um, I had a lot of part-time employees. They were all athletes. Um, but it was, yeah, it was tough being in retail and doing that. Um, but again, it was like I was all into both. And what happened for me was in 1984, LA Olympics happened, right? And um, my store in Manhattan Beach was one of the closest stores to LAX and all of the hotels. So they would bring the hotel buses and drop them off all the tourists in front of the, the mall. Yeah. And it was boon. So, you know, as you remember, the 1984 Olympics were boycotted by the Russians. Yep. So they thought <clears throat> that that would be, you know, a disaster. Um, so there were a lot of, um, of the concessionaires around the Olympic venues that pulled out. Mm. So I ended up taking some of those spaces also. Just crushing it, yeah. And, you know, we would sell, I think in the store we were doing like, between 14 and 16 dozen sweatshirt to t-shirts a day wow. uh, selling, you know, they all wanted Reebok because it wasn't distributed outside the country right. pretty much at that time. So, you know, it became a little bit of a drug as well because that was an amazing business. So it's, how do you give that up? So I ended up uh, keeping that for eight years. Um, but yeah, it was, it was all in. So I basically worked every day for about 10 years. I just finished watching the the movie Air, yep. and it kind of the parallels of that. Just the story of like starting so small, like building up, but like starting from your passion and turning into this thing. Super interesting. I have to imagine it was a really fun ride. Just seeing how it wasn't just this incredible brand that runners like yourself loved, but it was also just the celebrity effects that happened at that time were probably incredible. Yeah. So it's interesting because when I had my first store in Hermosa Beach, my road rep, his name was Charlie Denson. And the difference between Nike and Reebok was that Nike really nurtured those people within the company. Um, and Charlie ended up becoming president in North America of Nike, going from carrying a uh, you know, bag store to store to becoming president. Reebok took a different approach. They ended up hiring professional managers, didn't understand the, the market well. You know, we, we overtook Nike as number one in 1987 was a short-lived sort of number one position because there wasn't the same, there wasn't the same sort of approach. West Coast company, East Coast company, mm. much more traditional. Paul Fireman decided when, when we hit a billion dollars that he wanted to bring in professional managers. And it's my feeling that that's what sort of the difference was. And that's why Nike went like this and Reebok went the opposite way. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it was professional managers that tanked Reebok success. Yeah, I think that was, there, there were other things, but I think at the end of the day, there was a belief in, at Nike in those that created the brand, that were passionate about the brand, that they could be, you know, uh, upskilled uh, and they could lead the, you know, they could lead Nike beyond where Phil Knight started right. with it. And, um, you know, the proof's in the pudding. That's what happened. So you could put the manager in the runner, but you can't put the runner in the manager. Yeah, I think so. It's it's sort of Jim Collins, right? It's, you know, put the right people on the bus. And uh, I think that's what was lacking. Mm. Uh, so I ended up leaving in 1992, end of 92 and 93, um, because I, you know, the opportunity to me was gone. Understood. Yeah. Now at that time, you mentioned that you, you were... I would imagine a small company when they first started, you wore a lot of hats. You said sales, marketing, yep. field rep, et cetera. Yeah. Um, while you had your store, which I would say in itself is, you know, shopkeeping yep. and having a store is very much entrepreneurship yep. because you're in business for yourself. But what was it that created that spark after you left where you said, okay, now I'm going to go become a tech venture capitalist, yep. a tech entrepreneur. And I, I would say both those labels apply for you in your career, right? Yeah, it's, I have, uh, my career is very odd and it's uh, very meandering in many ways um, and it's not planned. And, you know, I think that's part of it, like mm. taking inspiration from, from different things and going with it. So when I left Reebok, uh, some of the guys that, that I'd worked with at Reebok that were some of my distributors, they started a, an online um, Yellow Pages called On Village. Mm. And this was early. This was like CompuServe, Prodigy coming out sure. of that, right? And they said, you know, you've helped build teams and blah, 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 and we need someone to work with us. So I, I ended up working with them, and they sold the company to Superpages about 18 months later. And I thought, this is, like, 
this is interesting. This internet thing's going to happen. Yeah. And and <laughs> I thought really, like when you're in a company that has 500% growth for five straight years, you're never going to replicate that. But when I saw the internet, I'm like, this is bigger. I just was completely immersed in that. And then when I had the, this experience with On Village, like this shit's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So um, a few years later, um, I was working for a company called Money Mailer and we were, um, it was a basically... Um, you know, like Valpac, they send the the little yep. envelopes with all the coupons. They hired me to start their digital. It was called Hot Coupons. And I met someone there who ended up becoming the founder of the first company that we started called Ad Auction in 1997. And the premise around Ad Auction was um, basically selling distress and remnant inventory online. Uh, and that was something that wasn't being done at all. And that actually harked back to my experience with Reebok because I had done a lot of that. I had was one of the guys who found places to distribute sort of seconds and overrun inventory. Uh, and uh, that's a that's a whole nother story in a sense, but but I had this understanding of what remnant was, right? You had to find places for that that didn't interrupt the normal flow. And for the audience here, before we pass to you, Dave, is, is what is remnant inventory? I mean, I know what it is, but just I think the audience would get some value in knowing what that means. Yeah. So at the time, if something's not booked within 30 days of a delivery date, it's going to expire, right? I mean, it's air, mm-hmm. right? So if it's not booked, you're just going to lose that revenue. So that happens today. When you watch TV at three in the morning, you're watching remnant inventory to some degree, right? And so it's not necessarily prime time, but it's valuable. And so we started to aggregate that and build, um, you know, inventory and start selling it to media buyers. Um, and we expanded beyond online. So we ended up doing um, out of home, so billboards. Uh, we ended up doing TV and radio. Um, but but the but the main thing really was was digital online. Um, and it was sort of catching the curve of the late '90s. You know, people hear a lot about you know, 99, 2000, and it was real. I mean, we're in San Francisco. Um, I have a co-founder. We're, you know, taken off. Um, we're raising uh, venture capital, not hard because it's the hottest space. And really, if you put a dot .com on anything, it was growing. If you guys remember, I'm sure yeah. you do. Um, so we had- So you raised $100 million. We could raise close to $100 million, yes. Um, so not a-, not a- no, and, and so, you know, here's someone who comes from the shoe business, right? And all of a sudden we're running this, literally one of the hottest, you know, companies, you know, in the Valley. And uh, I had a partner who ended up, you know, leaving the company um, for a variety of reasons. It wasn't working. So there was a founder issue between us, which created a board issue between sort of those who were you know, aligned to my co-founder and those who were not. Um, so it was one of those classic things of you're in this um, exploding market with great opportunity, but there's turbulence inside. And so the result of that was all these venture capitalists wanted to take us public. And coming from a company who was built on profits at Reebok, I'm like, but we're not making any money. They're like, it's okay, right? Um, so, so, you know, in hindsight now, after being a venture capitalist, I, I, I sort of get where they're coming from to some degree. But I was one of the resistant ones to say, we can't go public. We, we have no business, right, yet. And so when we actually did go public, they brought in a new CEO because we weren't the public CEO guys. And uh, we were filed to go public in March of 2000, and the market fell apart. So we never got out the door with the IPO, which in some ways was a blessing because as you know, everything went to zero or most everything went to zero. So it was a tremendous learning experience. You know, we went from two employees to over 300 in two and a half years. Um, As we said, we raised almost a hundred million dollars. We had some, you know, very well-known folks on our board and, and, um, excuse me, investors, um, but I took that experience and leveraged that to get to where, you know, we ended up getting to eventually. But, you know, it's painful when people tell you you're going to be rich beyond your imagination. And, you know, there was articles, 
you're in magazines, you're in this, you're in that, and all of a sudden it falls apart, it's really tough. And it, and it took its toll. It took its toll. It took years to get over that. I want to explore that in a second. I, I want to go back to your running. I recently read something that running, or heard something, that running was less about the physical pain and it was more about the mental challenge of running that long. Do you think that, that translates into entrepreneurship? Well, you know, there's the overused saying that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And it really is. And, um, you know, I ran 13 marathons. I ran five ultra marathons. Um, you know, and so you, you, there's two things. One is you endure pain and you also understand what endorphins are. And endorphins are the best natural high that you can get. Mm-hmm. And there's a point when you get to a seal level where you go out and run and, and you get to that level every time. And that's, it is a drug. Is that called a runner's high? It's a runner's high. Yeah. So, but it, you also endure the pain. Like there is literally, when you hit the wall, you hit the wall. And I've, I've had that happen to me multiple times where you literally cannot put one f- foot in front of the other, right? Because you've depleted yourself so much. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, you put yourself through that, that that doing things that are in the business side of that and during that pain, it's more about sort of emotional pain and stress and pressure. But I think leveraging the ability to to go through that pain athletically allows you to do that more. And I've always kept that, you know, fitness level. You know, um, I ran my last marathon when I was 40 to qualify for Boston, and I did. And then I went cold turkey into cycling. So I went to, you know, competitive cycling because it, you know, when you train, you know, 70, 80 miles a week and you don't hydrate because we didn't do that then and you don't stretch, it takes its toll, right? So I ended up doing that because you can, cycling is much easier in your body except when you crash. Um, but yeah, I think that's a long answer to your question. But I think there is, there's definitely a relationship between you know, the physical aspect and the sort of um, emotional and mental and drive that's required to be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. No, please go ahead. No, that was, it's interesting. Do you look for athletes now when, you, when you're when you investing in companies? Like, is there anything that you look for in particular? I would say that there's something about... Um, the way that you present yourself, that people who are not thoughtful about, you know, fitness, there's something that's missing. Mm. And I wouldn't say that, you know, every person has to be fit and athletic to invest Mm. in them, but there's something about that because, especially when you're a founder, endurance is critically important. If you're not healthy, you're not gonna make it, right? So I think there's something to that, but it's not necessarily a prerequisite. He used to get sick all the time and really started working out and being healthy. And now he's been, he doesn't get yeah. sick all the time. It took zero six days in 15 years, guy. You used to get sick for two weeks every single year. You would shut down for the first five years of the company. You, can, you, yeah. you want me to step in? <laughs> <laughs> he's lying. He's lying. I remember. He, would have he a, looks like he's fit. Come no, on. He, he is now. He is now. He's much better. But he, there, was a, there was a point where the stress and... And things were two weeks. It would take him out for two weeks. I remember. I'd be up. Oh, Pete's going down. We call we would call this the end of your burnout. I'll cover this for the audience because the audience might see value in it. Which is we we now give all of our companies, our employees, towards the end of the year, like a couple weeks off. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not against their PTO or that sort of thing, whatever. And the the real origin behind that was that when we were like really like seeing the forty percent, fifty percent, sixty percent growth years year over year, yeah. we burned ourselves out hard. So I think to your point about it being an endurance athlete, what what I learned the hard way is that self care is super important, whether yeah. it's meditation or sleep or diet or, or exercise. So he's absolutely right. You know, you can go in the gym and you could bench over three hundred pounds, but what he always had in, uh, going for him was I'd say the endurance thing. I don't think I ever. Ran until I first met you, right? You'll see. Slurp sauces. <laughs> <laughs> Your eating was different. 
You made a lot. You have to. You have to combine. Yeah, you know, great healthy point. habits with meditation. Yeah. You brought in meditation, hundred yeah. percent. And now you've broken that cycle. I don't think. I, I bet you, if you took away that end of the week, end of the year thing, you'd still be fine. Oh yeah, because you totally. have meditation and you have healthy habits and you do all the things that you do today. Let's also be honest. How many times do we back in the day have to work those two weeks? <laughs> every <laughs> yeah, that, that is memory that lane. Is, that is very true. That but it, very but true. it gives you a safe space. Like for me, I never um, ran with headphones or anything else. To me, it was really a, present. Yeah, be present in the moment, mm -hmm. and that's a place where, you know, you when you're that busy, and when you're there's that much incoming, that's the safe space. Yeah, right. So you talk about the motorcycle or back of snowboarding used to be our thing. That yeah. that's yeah. your moment where you just you're just in flow state. You're running exactly. I find these these periods these these activities where it's the only thing that shuts my brain off. Right. I can't. Yep. I don't think about. Like I dream about work. I dream, I, I woke up last night and I was like, oh, that was a good dream. Sometimes I'm like, that was a bad dream. But I'm thinking about all the things going on in my life. Yeah, There's no escaping it. But when I'm on my motorcycle, when I'm on a snowboard, when I'm scuba diving, yep. when I'm, you know, wake skating on the water, some, whatever it is, it's all, it just like all of a sudden the switch hits and it's like freedom. Yep. And I find this amazing peace yep. in those spaces. And everybody's, my, my wife was like, go ahead, go get another bike. And I was like, yes, I hadn't had a bike in years because I have kids and it's like dangerous. Yep. And, but I love it. I love it because it just shuts everything off. Well, that was part of my prenup. Yeah. No motorcycle. Really? Yes. <laughs> no jumping out of airplanes, no motorcycle. Have you jumped out? No. Probably never? smart for a guy like you. <laughs> yeah. Because you never did. Because you're doing like, with like, Exactly. 200, 200 jumps a year. Yeah. Like see, I'm not, I don't try, I, I don't push the limits of the bike. I just ride. It's not you on the bike that I worry about. It's yeah. other people. Like we, we would go snowboarding. Yeah. He's like 55 miles an hour down the, the mountain and I'm just surfing, just carving and having a good time, just chilling out. Right. Like there's no need. I'm not trying to kill myself. I'm just trying to disconnect. Yep. You know, I'm not in a rush to get to the bottom where I have to think now for the whole ride back up the exactly. mountain. I'm trying to just enjoy that moment. Same. I do the same thing when I go, yep. I, I commute to work. Yep. Speaking of something I never want for any of you, whether on the cycle or on the motorcycle, um, the one big thing that we always worry about is the crash. So yeah. I want to bring us back to our show here, which yeah. is in terms of the crash. So with ad auction, you were expecting to have this illustrious exit, this big IPO that is heralded and celebrated in, on all the, the TV shows, right? It didn't happen. Yeah. Um, it's around the 2000 era. So it's probably pretty emotionally crushing for you when that happens as well, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I was going through a divorce at the time um, that, crash happened uh and part of what saved me was uh m my relationship with uh, my now wife beverly she uh was came early on to an auction as a consultant in 1997 and we worked together a lot during that time it had no relationship but you know um we found a lot of commonality I mean, I grew up in Southern California. She she grew up in New York. Um, and what was common about those two places? There's not. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, I only, I I probably dated blonde women, you know, just because it's California. Sure. And um, she's, um, you know, grew up in a lot in Long Island. Um, so we we joke that like if we saw each other at the bar when we were twenty, we wouldn't even talk to each other, right? But you. You, when you work together, you find these common interests, and we would go to events and we, you know, do these things and travel. And again, it was there's no there was no romantic relationship, but it just evolved. And um, she was she was part of my my yeah. saving grace there. It's like it's really really tough emotionally, and you also have this feeling like we raised a lot of money. Yeah. And you feel like you let everybody out mm. from those seed investors put their personal money into, you know, Liberty Media and John Malone, right? Sure. And so um, that's a huge emotional, um, really, it's, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Right. Yeah. There's a sense of community. You, you need that, someone to pick you yeah. up. It's a great honor when someone gives you their money for your business to do what you need to do so that you can earn. And when you lose it, it, it 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 can rip you apart. It does. On top of going through a divorce. Yeah. Have you had 
so just to, to move out of that moment for a moment, for a second, and take you to your investing world now where you've invested in, I'd imagine, dozens and dozens of companies at this yeah. point. I would imagine you've seen that happen to someone, to, to founders, where they've gone through a divorce or a loss in their life. How do they, What's your advice to them? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple things. One is that, uh, you know, founding companies is super hard, as people that watch this, a lot of founders, I'm sure, go through that. And if unless there's a sense of support and unless there's also a sense of like you need to be able to separate that and understand that, you know, for me, my life was uh, in a, in midst of turmoil at that point. And so I needed to recover and I had kids then, right? Um, so I had to be a father too and um, going through all of this stuff and it was pretty public, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's one thing to, to do things and be disappointed when it's not public. When it's public, it makes it a lot harder. Yeah. And every area of your life at that point is seemingly feeling like it's falling apart, right? The business side, the personal side. Right. All these things. So it's like there wasn't like you could go retreat. You know, some people, when the relationship's not going right, they retreat to work and it works out well for them or the opposite happens. Right. There was no place to retreat except for probably the road for the running. That was it. Right. And so what I did was um, I had to, I literally was unable to work for a while. And then I sort of lift myself up with Beverly helping me tremendously as a partner. And, and I think that's part of it too. Like, you know, we worked together, um, hand in hand for, you know, 25 years. Wow. And it's kind of amazing that everything we do is together and it's been that way. Um, so that was, that was, you know, a savior for me, but also you sort of have to start from ground zero again. So I did. And I started, I uh, worked for a company um, in the lead generation space. I helped them uh, get acquired. Then I went to another one um, called Aptimus that was pink listed. We got them back listed and that ended up be, being a big success. They ended up getting acquired by Apollo. I started to get some momentum again, right? Because you, you, know, you have a few wins and then you get some momentum. And uh, we did a couple other startups during that time period. And then in 08, um, I had this brilliant idea of starting a venture fund and then the market fell apart, you know, the big crash, right? We were literally in New York trying to raise capital to start a venture firm because really when I raised money, I thought most of the VCs were worthless, right? They didn't add any value. And when I needed somebody to call, I didn't have anybody to call. So when we started this fund, I wanted to be that person, right? I'm going to give you money, but I'm going to be the guy that you call. And by the way, that's still a fact about the, most of the VCs. Yeah. <laughs> now, being a VC, I have to be careful. About <laughs> but uh, but it was I really felt that way. You know, there there wasn't the committed the commitment for them to take the call on Sunday night at ten o'clock, and that's where you know being with Beverly, uh, she understood that. Because I would get those calls Sunday night at 10 o'clock, and he's like, you need to take that call, right? And that's super helpful yeah, because you have that empathy. I was going to say empathy is key. Yeah, yeah it, it really is. And, and I think that's what has propelled us into a sense of success because we ended up raising that money in 2009, 2010, starting out you know, a, a fund. We also started an incubator called Quick Labs. We were the first incubator in San Francisco. And um, just doing the work. I mean, literally coming out of 2008, there was real estate everywhere. There was in San Francisco. It was ghost a, town. It was a ghost town. So we got 25,000 square feet given to us. They're like, here, do something with it. And the companies that came in gave it a little bit of equity, like very small. And we we started to get companies in there, kind of like what you guys do here, which is the space is phenomenal, Thank by you. the way. Um, and we did that and, and we started to really put the work in and we raised our venture fund on the back of our, uh, of our, uh, of kick labs, our accelerator and started to see some success. Uh, and you know, some of those companies came out of there were public companies that came out of there. So, you know, putting the work in, um, and the Valley is an interesting place where you really have to be inside in many ways. Right. I mean, it's true. Like. 
they're the deal. A lot of the deals that that are funded never hit the street, right? It, it could be a you know previous founder that you invest in, and that gets in you know previous uh, investors get access to that or whatever it may be, you know. And it, but you have to put the work in. I mean, we were in the valley for you know thirty years, so you you have that network. You start building that those relationships, and that's part of the success is you get access to the best deals as well. But even so, you still have to put the work in, you know. And the best um, resource, the best, um, you know, deals come from the founders you invest in. Either they start a company or they recommend you to another founder. That's where the deal flow is, right? And that's that's what happens. So you know, we started in oh eight oh nine, um, and you know, the market started taking off and we've, we had this bull market for 12 years. So we had incredible success. We had 38 exits, um, you know, and it, you know, the rest is sort of history, but, um, can we, let's just touch on them for a second okay. because you're being modest with, with what you did. Kick Labs, who came out of Kick Labs? Well, probably the best known one was Wish. Wish. Yeah. Yeah. Which IPO'd in the billions though. No? Yeah, it did. It's not doing great now, mm-hmm. but but you exit at the right time. Um, yeah. Uh, Angel List too? Angel List, well, we incubated an Angel List. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Naval and Nivy um, yep. started an Angel List in Kick Labs. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so um, there's a company called Real Gravity that that came out of there, had a great exit, and, you know, um, we actually had to make a decision. Are we going to be incubator or investor? Mm-hmm. So in 2012... Uh, we decided that we wanted to be exclusively an, an investor, mm-hmm. and um, that's when co-working started to really get, you know, catch some fire. And a friend of ours, Duncan Logan, started an organization called Rocket Space. Beverly actually named Rocket Space the, yeah. uh, so she takes credit for that. <laughs> um, but they they had a co-working that we moved all of our portfolio companies in that co-working space, and companies like Uber were there. Coinbase was there, um, like Uber, uh, before Travis, like, sure. Yeah. Very early. And, um, those, they were all, we were all living together in this place. We had no idea that there would be billions of value coming out of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and we saw Uber and, and I'm like, this is not going to work because a, they were being sued by all the cities. Mm-hmm. And B, all these black car drivers were coming in. They couldn't figure out how to use the apps. Mm. So we're like, ah, this thing ain't going to work. Um, and um, we met, uh, you know, Coinbase early on as well before they went into YC. And it seemed kind of like a strange idea and this idea of Bitcoin. And it was intriguing. But, um, you know, Brian had just left Airbnb and Airbnb was starting to take off. I'm like, why were you leaving? It, it, I couldn't put it together. Mm-hmm. As a result, um, we started a, um, a partner fund mm-hmm. because our LP fund was very specific around media, e-commerce, um, and then we, we got into SaaS investment. So anything that was outside of that, because we missed those two, mm-hmm. you know, beyond unicorns, decacorns, I don't know what you call them now. <laughs> um, so we put some money into a private fund and we said, anything that's outside of that sort of moonshot stuff, we're going to invest in. So we've done, I think, 22 investments in that. And now we have um, Boom uh, Boom Aero, which is a supersonic jet. We've got um, Regent, which is a new seaplane. We've got um, Albedo, which is um, uh, digital imagery, satellite imagery. Um, Otis, which is a vertical lift aircraft. So we've got all these things that literally are sort of moonshot ideas that we started investing outside of our fund because we really felt like we needed to be very disciplined about the fund, and um, we're going to add value to those companies. The ones in our partner fund, like I can't tell Blake at you know Boom how to run a supersonic jet, um, but there are certain areas within our LP fund that I could really add value. So that's kind of how we segmented. I just re- uh, watched a funny story from Mark Cuban. Apparently, he met Travis, and Travis tried to get him into the into Uber. And he was offering him a ten million dollar valuation, yep. and he said, "I'll do it at five. Yeah. And Travis never called him back, and never called him again. Yeah. After that, um, yeah. Travis is an interesting guy. It's we have a kind of a funny Cuban story because we had a um, a company called Scan, 
that we invested in. It was basically a QR code company. And these young guys at a BYU, um, I was introduced to, to them through a, a friend of mine who was a, a seed investor. And he says, you got to meet these guys. And so I met Gary G, who was the founder, and he was a sophomore at BYU. And at the time, there was probably 50 other QR code scanning apps. Yeah. But I was really intrigued by him. And it's, it, it comes back to like, there's something about founders, regardless of product, that you just really intrigue you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he was on the soccer team, D1 uh, player in a soccer team, and he's starting this business. And when he, uh, when he set meetings, he'd come like, Tuesday, Wednesday, he'd set these meetings like early in the morning, always. And I didn't know what the deal was. Turns out that he was flying to the Bay and he would take the meetings like one day, fly back to go to soccer practice. He did it 28 times to raise his round and he did. Um, um, So an incredible guy, he ended up being the captain of the team and they were number one in the nation when he was a senior. It's an amazing story. Commitment. But- um, I knew the guys early at Shark Tank mm-hmm. and before they started doing, you know, high value companies and Max who's one of the producers would call me and like, do you have companies? And I'd say, no, because you're taking 5%. Mm-hmm. For the first two or three years, they took 5% of any company that went on. The show did. The show did. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're, you're going to get shitty company yeah. if, the, you're get, if you take 5%. So we finally called and said, okay, we're going to stop doing that. So one of the first companies was Scan. Mm-hmm. So Scan got on Shark Tank. And Cuban um, just drilled him, <laughs> in my opinion, didn't invest. And about a year and a half later, they were bought by um, Snap for a big exit. So I sent him a quick minute <laughs> just to let him know. <laughs> but yeah, that's the that's a Cuban story. But um, Mark is a you know, great investor, very intuitive. He's also, we'll get to our nonprofit, but he's also supportive of that as well. Yeah, I want to get into the into that into the nonprofit, but before we do, I'd like for you to open up the kimono a little bit. So you started, we always ask the question, which you already answered, horse or jockey? Yep. It's clearly jockey for yep. you. Yep. But being in the Valley is a very special place because you it's a very special place because you have obviously founders that are starting companies and then, rest, you know, that exit companies and they, they, they're a bit, you know, uh, they do others and so on, they're serial. Um, but there's also a tremendous amount of talent coming out of Stanford and and other places, and all the talent that we, even guys we know that are out here, they go to the valley, and you know they're really smart guys. How do you differentiate these moonshot ideas and and these founders and know where to place your bets? Like what what is it? Because at the end of the day, every deck looks the same now. It's Tam, it's this, it's that. So what is it for you and your team, and what have you trained people to look for that says? This is how we identify the the winners. Have this guys- is Theranos. This is the real deal. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think it's it's art and science, man. I think it's um, there's something about having an intuition about people, mm-hmm. and I think there's a people skill that we've actually utilized now in other ventures. We'll, we'll talk about, but I think there's a there's that uh, intuition about people's character. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is in a hot market, you have to make decisions very quickly, yeah. right? So you, you don't do proper due diligence, so it's a bit risky. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the first thing. It's sort of the blink moment. It's sort of Malcolm Black, sure. uh, Gladwell sort of like blink moments. Yep. Those are very, um, you know, that happens a lot in the Valley or just investing in mm-hmm. general. You have to make decisions very quickly, mm-hmm. right? So I think that's part of it. Part of it is referral. You know, part of it is, hey, this person, I knew this person from before or whatnot, you know? Um, so... Again, I, I think that's something that's not necessarily taught. It's hard to teach that, I think. What else do you do to due diligence people? I, I, I ask personally because I've I've gotten into a deal or two where I had a referral, an introduction, someone else I trusted, yeah. and then later on other details come out. Yeah. And it's like at the time, because you're moving quickly, it's hard to know. Or people oh, embellish their, their embellish their their resumes, they uh, they take credit for shit that they didn't do. Sure. And there's all these 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 things. And then now you look back, and it's like, it's one of the only things that I harp on where where I lose sleep over. Because so I'm like, how did I not see this? Founder fuckery. Now it's whole founder fuckery. Um, that's a great. You should get a t-shirt made of that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I'll buy it. Um, 
Tell me your sizes. I got you guys. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and, and call Mark. Hey, Cuban, you want to join me? <laughs> right? So we've asked investors, we've asked other guys that are in funds. It's like, how do you do diligence someone? Like, what, are, what is the criteria? Like, or, or is there a, a perfect method? No. The answer is no. And there's been some founders that I thought, this is the one, and it's just flop, flop. And some that are just unexpected that have just done extraordinarily well, right? So, you know, I think that's why venture e economics are what they are. I mean, it's an 80-20 thing. Right? Yeah. And, you know, uh, if you can get above, like, our success rates over 50%, that's pretty high for venture, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, it's, it's, I think it's luck, timing, you know, it's not all skill. I think there's part of being in the market the right time, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but also... I think it's a little bit coming from you as well, because founders need to, it's it's not a one-way thing, right? Mm -hmm. There needs to be an understanding of what this relationship's gonna be, mm -hmm. right? So it's hard to do that in the first conversation, but it's also like you build a reputation, like founders wanna be with you, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're gonna support them. So I think that's part of it. It's a little bit of a mutual admiration thing that happens mm -hmm. when that marriage happens. And, and it truly is a marriage, as you guys know, like, you know, especially when you're dealing with a SaaS product or something that takes a long build, you're talking about seven, 10, 12 years before you're gonna see any exit. Mm -hmm. And so you live with that, those folks for a long time, especially early for us being seed investors. Absolutely. First year or two, you're with them a lot. Now, as they go further along, that that becomes less frequent. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, I, I can't answer it really. Yeah. You know, it's it's a tough one. What about, so I've had other friends that were in investors, family offices, uh, venture firms, early stage seed, you know, series A. And they're and they're out. They don't want to be a part of it anymore. They said that the economics are actually not good anymore. Um, I've heard that too. I'm curious. Yeah, it's funny. What's your take on that? We didn't that? discuss this, but I just, I just heard that same thing the other day. Yeah. Well, and there's a reason why we didn't raise another fund. Yeah. Um, you know, a fund commitment is a minimum of ten years, right? Yeah. And so I think part of it was getting back to this idea of challenge. I wanted to see a if we could raise a fund and b if we could make it successful. I never was chasing the money. It really wasn't that. It was like, I think I can do this. Can I get to Hawaii? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I'll then I'll fly to Hawaii. Speaking of dead reckoning, yeah, exactly. So, um, so that was part of it. It's like this wasn't money motivated. This was like a challenge. Like, can I be a successful VC without a pedigree, right? Mm -hmm. And no VC was going to hire me because they didn't have pedigree. So I had to start my own, right? And so I think that's part of it. Um, that you know, uh, I'm not sure where we're going with that. I, I, I'm friends with a lot of venture guys, family offices, family yep. offices, started venture funds. Yep. Um, they were in the game. They did their 10 years. Maybe they yep. did one or two funds and now they're all out. Yep. They're all closing down. They're all yep. saying no more funds. Yep. Going, the, the, the wells are dry and because they said that the economics are no longer good. And I'm, I'm curious what happened in the space? Why did the economics go so badly? Well, I think part of it is that it's noisy. Like, in the last 15 years, the number of VCs that has, has exploded, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's a VC, yeah, right? So that's part of it. And I also think that, you know, uh, what we found is that, um, you know, you you have to wait years before there's a payoff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the way venture works, as you guys know, you have to pay back the fund first before you see anything, mm -hmm. Right. So you have to have some some pretty significant wins to pay that back, and but it takes you, you know, our first fund was pretty fast. We paid it back in four years. That's fast, mm -hmm. but generally you're talking about five, six, seven, eight years. So the patience, you know, um, I don't have that patience anymore. I'm, you know, I, I'm not raising another fund because it's another ten year commitment. Yeah. But what we started to do the side fund that we did, um, that's directly us. Yeah. Right. And so there's the payback is immediate. Um, but I think though, that having the venture fund first uh, gave us that latitude to do our own fund. Mm -hmm. You know, it got that, we established a reputation and, and so forth. Um, and it also gave us the liquidity to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we never took a management fee ever in, you know, was it now, you know, 13, 14 years, we never took a management fee. We always reinvested that. Mm -hmm. Why not? Just curious. 
because we could, first of all, and so that's how we started our partner fund. We took all our management fees and put it into our partner fund and, and invested in those moonshots. Right. So it created it created a you were able to leverage that capital in a, in a in the moonshots property. Right. Exactly. So that's that's how we did it. We just yeah. made an agreement like we're just not going to take this money. You know, we could afford to do it, so we we did that, um, and that's been you know that's awesome. Kind of extraordinary the how that's turned out. Do you think any like? I know, like Andreessen Horowitz, for example, they had, I, I forget what, what it was, but he had said that a fund to succeed has to hit a certain number, and then he came in below that number on one of his funds. One of his funds closed, and it came in below. And I think being that they're like the prolific, you know, one of the top 10 VC yeah. firms in the country, I think that, do you think that opened up everybody's eyes and said, well, if they can't do it in the Valley, that's the problem? Yeah, well, it, I know all the people are chasing IRR and this and that, but like it, it was clear when the numbers came out, they were like, he put his foot in his mouth on Twitter and then came in below that number. Yeah. But is is that a brand thing or a unicorn thing? Because I think that that's the thing that, that I wonder about. You probably have a better answer to it than I do. So that's not, I'm not a BC, but I think about like the name injury scenario, it's A16Z, right? Yeah. Like we were so bought into that because of some other early windfalls, right? Is that to say that they're the best at what they do when juxtaposed against the sea of VCs that are out there? Or is it to say that they have one of the best brands in venture capital? I don't know the answer, but I, I think, think it's a little bit of both. Okay. You know, they, they approached it very differently. They came in uh, both successful entrepreneurs. I mean, sort of legendary in a sense, Ben and, and Mark. The hard thing about hard things, one of my favorite books ever. Well, um, and so they came up with credibility. They also, we always talking about before, networks. Like they knew everybody in the Valley. Right? Um, so they could get access to deals. But they also built this um, organization that would, it's it talked about this idea of supporting entrepreneurs, right? Mm. Like they, they had a whole brand thing where they brought brands in and tried to match brands with startups. And, you know, they have every type of service that they provide for startups, I don't know how many hundreds of people they have now in the organization. It's big. Um, so they took that venture model and they kind of put it on its ear because no one had ever done anything like that at scale. Mm. So I think that really intrigued a lot of people. They were very bullish in, you know, in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as well. Um, you know, and we'll see what happens, right? Mm. You know, um, you know, that's, that's still out there to see if all of that comes back around. It may. I'm still kind of bullish on that as well. But, you know, I think um, they created a reputation and they had success. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have raised billions and, you know, it's it's tough to compete with that in many ways too. Right. You know, I mean, you know, you get a Sequoia or you get a Benchmark or you get a, you know, A16Z or whatever. I mean, they dictate what's going on. And they also, you know, we were, you know, part of, you know, felt this as well. Like they would come in on a series A and they'd take the whole round. All right. So, you know, for me, you know, in one sense, and they're paying a premium. And this happened to us multiple times where, you know, we're seed investors. We're basically want, you know, we do this because we want our pro rata, right? Mm -hmm. And we're putting in the work and then you get cut out. So it's kind of like you have to balance you know, is the premium worth it or do you want to continue to invest? But they have done that a lot where they cut people out. So you kind of have to balance, you know, is that something that, that I want to be part of or not? Mm. You know, It's all about the pro rata because it, the deal, the thing that I struggle with is when you look at the deals and you look at these people with ideas, when you're, if you're pre-seed, seed or series, I'd say pre-seed or seed, the deals now, it's like, oh, it's a safe no with a $10 million valuation. You're like, you have nothing. Most often, these companies have very little, and then you don't get me started at safe notes. <laughs> no, let's let's go. Let's, let's go, go. man. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's a. Pro I think safe notes are probably probably part of the issue that that created the downfall of, of venture, especially early stage. Rob, nobody wants to. We're going to upgrade these beverages. We're going to the safe note. Now. Okay, <laughs> let's upgrade the beverages. I mean, if you have thoughts, and then I I really want to cover last mile because it's fascinating, yeah. and what you've done there is is, yeah. is prolific in in, yeah. its, in its own right. Man, you could. And what you're continuing to do, but yeah, let's talk. Let's, talk, yeah. let's talk last mile, and then I want to just query you a little bit on just some of your leadership principles, sure. because I think that a the audience I think we get a lot of value, and b yeah. selfishly I just want to know how to find more runners. Sure. So safe notes. <laughs> um, well, there used to be notes that had um, 
you know, a couple things. One, they had interest rate and they also had expirations, right? So SafeNote doesn't have either. Uh, so, you know, as a seed investor, you know, um, and why it really came out of YC, to be honest with you. I mean, they set the standard for that. You know, look, I've had a lot of success with YC, so I'm not going to diss YC. But, you know, this is one of the things that came out of there that's, to me, is not appealing as an investor at all because it it doesn't provide this the sort of foundation of what it was really set up to be, right? Mm-hmm. It's the idea that you're going to basically loan you money with an expiration date and you have to hit that date uh, raise money, uh, and that equity, uh, or that, that basically loan turns into equity, right? That's kind of the premise of, you know, original notes. Um, now you could have a safe note go for 10 years, right? There's no urgency to convert that at all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the way that it's set up, uh, it has been with YC and a lot of, of accelerators is there's, there's a common preferred part of that too, right? So part of what you end up getting is common out of that. Mm-hmm. And so it's not classically what we started with was saying, I'm going to invest in a note that's going to convert. It's all going to convert to preferred and, you know, I'm going to be at the top of the stack. So here, when it converts, you're kind of here and here, right? Yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of broken up this original sort of premise of what a uh, a note, convertible note should have actually been. Yeah. And I think it's created a lot of issues. I mean, we've actually had companies that we've called back our money because they've turned it into a lifestyle brand. It's like, I'm never going to see my money. Mm-hmm. You guys are making money, but I'm never going to have an exit. So return it, mm-hmm. which is a little bit counter, but I'm like, I want my money back. Yeah. Is that hard to do? It was hard to do. We've done it twice. Okay. Have, so, well, it's some like difficult conversations, but do you we've think, done that. So I just thought of this now, and I'm, I could be completely wrong, but do you think that now that interest rates are continuing to rise, that the safe is going is the safe is going away? Because if you're smart money, you're like, why would I ever put anything into a non-interest bearing account when I can get five free percent off of Wells Fargo? Well, the, what keeps safe notes alive is YC. I was going to say, they're famous for four-letter agreements, right? The safe note, the fast note. I always call it the fuck note because yeah. right? I've done a lot of safe investments. Yeah, so. there you yeah. go. Yeah. So when you have, I don't know, 300 companies per class, that's a lot of companies out there. And so that's going to continue to proliferate the safe note. So I don't think that's going away. Yeah, and, plus and their brand is, is, is strong, like AZ-16. They, got, they, they built a good brand. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the premise of, of YC is pretty amazing because it's built in this network. Yeah. The network is incredible. We get a dozen a dozen YC companies a week emailing, looking for angel money and yeah. seed money and that sort of thing. It's crazy. Yep. So last mile. Yes. So now you are, Transmedia is winding down? Well, we're we're still active, but we're fully invested. Fully invested. Fully invested, yeah. So we have another dozen companies still active. But you've had some heroes. Snap, yeah. Facebook. Yeah. 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 What's, your, what's your biggest exit? business. You don't have to get into the dollars. I would say that the most, we'll take dollars away. Yeah. The most profound uh, exit was my first one. Um, when I was at ad auction, it was 1998 and, um, I was CEO at the time and my partner PWC called me and said, I've got this young guy from Utah in my office. I don't know what to do with him. Can you take him out to lunch? Because okay. At the time, very few companies outside the Valley were getting funded, right? Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, 23 years old and, you know, going to BYU. I took him out to lunch and it's one of the few times that I made a commitment on the spot. I went back to Beverly, who was working for me, or working as a consultant. I said, you need to invest too. (laughs) And she's like, what? But we did. Um, uh, His name is Josh James. He ended up... um, founding what ended up being Omniture that was, yeah. uh, you know, a public company acquired and then he, and then he, um, started Domo, which was also a public company. So, um, and that relationship, um, spans to today, you know? So I think for me, that was the most significant investment because it really got me started mm-hmm. and, uh, I went through that whole experience and also we had many, many 
conversations during that time. He almost went out to business, uh, out of business. He was going to be acquired. We went through that, like oh, you know, Saturday 10 p.m. conversation. One of those, right? And so that's the most significant because it's the first, and it's something that also is beyond just money that we have a, a friendship mm-hmm. that still is there today. It's special. Well sent. So now. With all of the, you've gone, run, we've gone through runner's highs, we've had some pitfalls, we've hit the transmedia, venture capital high of exiting companies and doing great investments, and then you started The Last Mile. Mm-hmm. So t- for the audience, tell us about The Last Mile. What Last is Mile is uh, technology training inside prison. Uh, and it's one of the things, you know, certainly I would never predicted, A, that I would have a nonprofit, and B, that I would be spending so many times and days in prison. Uh, voluntarily, voluntarily, I actually wrote a um, a piece for uh, the TED site years ago. Beverly and I did a TED talk, and and they asked me to write an article on it. And it was, um, I've spent over five hundred days in prison, never committed a crime. Um, I've spent many more days in, since then. But um, wow, uh, in two thousand ten, I had a friend who was doing some mentoring in San Quentin. San Quentin is a, obviously a very well known prison outside of San Francisco. And she's, yeah, well, um, it's the oldest prison in California is built in 1852. Uh, and she said, I've got these guys that are asking me about business. Can you just come up one night and talk to them? I'm like, no, why would I come in prison? A, they're not going to understand what I'm talking about. And B, it's prison. Uh, but she, you know, asked me multiple times and I finally relented. And one night I went up, um, and it's dark. San Quentin is a very ominous place. Uh, it's historic and, uh, to get to the classroom, you have to walk through the gates, walk down this road across the prison yard is at night into this classroom. I walk in and there's about 50 guys in there and I had this sort of land thing. Yeah. Well, we call them residents now, but yes, incarcerated men in San Quentin, uh, all dressed in blue. Uh, and I started talking and I was going to present and then go home. I told Beverly, it's going to be, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, whatever. <clears throat> Three hours later, I'm not home yet, but this conversation, this presentation turned into a conversation. And what I saw in those men was what I saw in many of the founders that pitched me. Mm. Like there was a, something in their eye and the questions that they asked me, the conversation we had. I had several guys hand me business plans that they wrote with a prison pencil. They're finally, I get to show this to somebody. So I was completely blown away and I went home that night and Beverly was obviously concerned. I walk in the door and I go, you can't believe what I saw. We're going to start a technology incubator inside San Quentin. I just said that. She said, no fucking way am I going into prison, as a New Yorker would say. And uh, I said, no, 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 you need to see what I saw. So. About a did, month. She look, did she scan you for shanks? <laughs> I was I was upright. That was okay. I was upright. Shanks yeah. Are... So I said, no, you need to come in and see what I saw. So about a month later, she came in and um, met some of the guys, and we said, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna again being all in. We're not just gonna um, sort of be on the perimeter. We're gonna go in and teach an entrepreneurship class that we're gonna create. So for two years, two nights a week, Tuesday, Thursday night, we went into San Quentin and taught this class. And it was taking all the sort of inputs that we um, had as VCs, investors, and put it into actual curriculum. In 2012, we had the first demo day in a California prison. We had six guys pitch their pitches, their four minute pitches, and in San Quentin, there's a chapel there that holds about 350. We had, it was full of people. We had venture capital friends of mine and media. CNN was there. Wow. Uh, and none of these guys had ever pitched or public, did any public speaking. And all of them knocked it out of the park. In blue, in blue or did they get to wear snow? No, in blue. In the blues. Oh, yeah. 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 In blues. I've, I've heard from, so a friend of mine has done some work with like the Joseph Campbell Foundation, that sort of thing. And, and he uses myth and story to help um, like trauma and the folks who are, who are in prison. And he said some of the best storytellers he's ever met are people that are incarcenated because there's an ability to tell stories is, is everything. 
Well, I mean, some of the best entrepreneurs are in prison. They're just, you know, selling the wrong stuff. So that's what I was going to, I was actually going to ask you, is there a, cause I'd imagine like a, a pedophile is not going to make a great entrepreneur potentially, but a drug dealer would. Have you seen trends sure. or is it, or is it mostly, or is it, or is it, have you been fooled and you've seen people that you didn't? Yeah, I think, you know, our success rate is pretty phenomenal. Um, and I give all credit to the people in the program. Yeah. You know, we're just setting a path for them. Yeah. But, you know, this sense of commitment, determination and, and willingness to do something after they get out of prison, really, you know, create a better life after they serve their time. That's really true. But it's a progression. You know, San Quentin is level two, which means that it's still um, maximum security in a sense, but you get your points the, to the uh, where you have, you know, freedom to, to go around, take classes and so forth. You know, many of those people started at level four, which is, you know, a lot of solitary confinement there, you know, restricted yards, that type of thing, and you work your way down. So when people get to a place like San Quentin, they're ready, you know. And we saw that. So we, we started to, you know, sort of nurture that. And uh, as I said, the commitment level is phenomenal. Um, so, you know, they would practice their pitches. And I said, you got to practice at least 100 times, you know. Find your celly, find someone in the yard, go in front of a mirror. And they did it. And I, I always say that you have to take it from your head to your heart. You know, you got to pitch from here. Mm. And that's what they did that day. And so from that day, you know, Beverly and I realized that we had something, that, that there was something that we could evolve. And our commitment level just went to another level mm. where we said, you know, we, we see that this can, with the, we had six guys and we see that uh, we think we can scale this. And the, the tragedy is there are very few programs even today, you know, after all this time, but so we did, we, we did several demo days. And then in 2014, we made a commitment saying we need to, to train hireable skills. It's great to, to be able to articulate, you know, be an entrepreneur, but you know, the expectation to start a business after you get out of prison for decades is difficult. It's, you know, the success rate is minimal for people who aren't in prison. Mm. So how can we do something where we're teaching hireable skills? So we said, we're going to teach coding. And people said, you're nuts. How are you going to teach coding in prison? There's no connectivity. Computers aren't allowed and whatnot. Um, but we ended up getting some champions within the California Department of Corrections. Um, and they really supported us on this. We took the old print factory in San Quentin, which had not been used for years, a 22,000 square feet. We gutted a portion of that down to the sticks, put in new power grid, wireless, built five classrooms. And that today is, you know, our flagship tech center in San Quentin. And then we started to um, grow within in California, opening in different prisons. Um, and to today, we're soon to be in 10 states. And uh, we have people all over the country who've been our, through our program working for tech companies as software engineers. So, you know, it worked. And, you know, it's, again, believing in those people and having them believe in us every one of our classrooms has a sign that says believe in the process yeah. because early on in the class i would get up in front of my wave my arms and say you know if you work really hard you're going to get a job in silicon valley and they kind of roll their eyes and like you're full of shit. i said you have to believe and that became sort of embedded um so now people believe because it's happened ted lasso you ever watched that of course <laughs> believe believe yeah it's, it's all about yeah it, i mean it's everything if you can't if you don't believe it just doesn't happen you got to manifest it i believe that um so that's incredible so how many how many how many people so now you're in seven states we're in seven we're we're going to be opening in um new york hopefully soon and um rhode island we just opened in massachusetts we're doing since we're on the east coast we're actually you know going that direction illinois pennsylvania texas you're in blue and red states blue and red yeah, it's inter <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because the first expansion state was Indiana, yeah. and um, uh, Governor Holcomb heard about the last mile, so he sent a couple of his folks from the corrections to San Quentin, and you know, again, we're in the Bay Area, you know, we're liberal Democrats, right? I had never really had a lot of uh, political, you know, exposure per se into parties and whatnot, but so. Those guys come out, they come back, 
report to him and I get a call from him. Wow. Saying, Chris is Eric Holcomb. I want to start the last mile. So we had about an hour conversation. Then ended up flying out there and meeting with him. And, you know, again, you know, Indiana, he took over after Pence and it's like, you know, I, I'm not sure. They are now the most progressive state. We, we start, we do a lot of our testing with them. We have an audio video production program. They were the first one to launch that now. Um, we're going to be doing a full studio in Putnamville prison. It's a full audio video production studio we're building there. Um, so Governor Holcomb has been phenomenal and, you know, we're in Oklahoma, Kevin Stitt and we're in Montana. Um, it makes sense because if you want to, st if you want to stop recidivism that, and break the chain in these communities of families continuing to go back to prison, yep. this is a, this is, this, th I hate to say kill two birds with one stone because we don't want to commit any crimes, but at the same time, if yep. you are doing at your, 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 we're rewriting the fabric of the future and filling the companies that you love and that need the talent and need people like this to right. fill in this, to fill in the suit so that they stop sending it overseas and so on and so forth. There's something to be said about that too. I think in terms of you talk about grit, something you talked about early on the, yeah. sh on the, the show today. And, you know, I think about the workforce today and how much, you know, our first company that we started at, we're millennials. We started out of hiring a lot of millennials. Yeah. Now most of our new companies, you know, employ Gen Z, yeah. um, younger generation, very different mindset as a, as a generation in terms of, you know, what world they grew up, they came into and that sort of thing. I think about words like commitment. I'll skip work ethic so I don't get destroyed like I did last time on the last episode, <laughs> but we'll talk about commitment. We'll yeah. talk about dedication to the craft, whatever that work might be, yeah. purpose, yeah. all that. I think about some of these young men women, et cetera, that um, end up as residents in these programs. Thank you for yep. giving me some new language. And I think about the grit and the tenacity that these folks will have versus the grit and the tenacity of someone who grew up with every affordance in their life. You know, who are you going to bet on, right? You talk about jockeys and, yep. and horses, right? Yep. I want to bet on the jockey that's going to run the full race. Yep. And if someone could make it through 10 years in prison and incarcerated and then comes out, goes through one of your programs, I have to imagine that the level of commitment and outcome that 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 employee or contributor might create. Again, I'm I'm, I'm not a betting man here, but I'd be willing to bet that um, it's tremendously bit better. Yeah. So when the first few guys started getting out of San Quentin, we are in men's and women's prisons today. Um, I ask a few of my friends who are CEOs to just give them a, sh a chance, like create a, an internship or something, and what happened was was completely counterintuitive where the trepidation of hiring somebody formerly incarcerated like this is going to disrupt our culture was just the opposite because again that work ethic people saw it they were happy to be there every day you know and they were all transparent about their stories like everyone that comes out of tlm their story you're 100 transparent about what i did you can ask me anything about it and that i think helped a lot but bringing that um energy that you didn't expect. And that's what really lights the place up. Pervasive now everywhere. Like people come out, it's not a job, it's a mission. Like mm. you're giving me a chance, I'm gonna do this, right? And loyalty, like the Valley has no loyalty. You know, we've got seven guys at Slack. I don't think they're ever gonna leave because they're all senior software engineers, they're doing great and they feel loyal because their first job. We've got two guys there that are senior software engineers given life sentences juveniles. We got out as a result of something called Prop Thirty Six in Cali or Prop yeah. Fifty Seven in California. Um, they're senior software engineers making good money. I, I know they're making multiple six figures, whatever that is today. I know what they started at, um, but they're grateful, right? And you know that's something that's missing in a lot of these companies today. Like, where's the loyalty? Where's the commitment that you get from these people, right? I would like to introduce you to the governor in Connecticut, Governor Lamont. I think he he's progressive. He's a tech yep. guy, smart. His wife is a VC, yep. uh, Annie, and uh, I think he would he would jump on this. Connecticut was the first state to uh, actually this woman Diane who uh, has family members in prison. She was the the lead behind it to make phone calls free, mm. right? Yes, yeah. yeah. I she, saw that she yep. did that here. Yep, and uh, you, like so. She, 
because you get disconnected from your family, you mess up, and now you can't talk to your children unless you can pay, and they have to. So it oh, wow. it, it breaks families. Yep. So she said she her, her son was in prison, and so she got it. So now it's free for all prisoners. It's huge. And that makes a huge difference. It's huge. So there's companies like JTL and JPay that that charge exorbitant rates for for calls which is ridiculous yeah, it's a profit center these prison the private prison systems is yeah i mean we've made a commitment we were not going to be in any private prisons um and you know we're we continue to expand we we self-funded a lot of this when we started um it was our commitment both beverly and i that that we want to create something that we have control of and that also we we can know that we can scale it so we are sort of a business that happens to be a nonprofit, and all of our locations, they're almost like franchises. Mm -hmm. They're all run the same. Everything is done virtually. We do a virtual instruction inside the classroom. Um, all of the computers are provisioned by us. We have a command center in San Francisco that monitors every keystroke of every computer in every classroom. Um, half of our, we have 45 employees. 21 of those are graduates of our program or participants of the program. All of our instructors are participants of the program. All of our help desk are. We have a reentry department, all you know, formerly incarcerated. So, you know, that's something we want to continue to build. We're also building social enter enterprises. We're probably going to launch our first one this year, and we want to take that venture model um, to this uh, community where um, we are taking graduates and participants of the program. We're starting businesses that are for-profit businesses that they can work in. Um, it'll be coding, front end coding, social media management, uh, video editing, audio, um, engineering, and will be outsourced agencies that they can long-term vest and become equity owners in the business. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's something, that's the next iteration of what we're doing because we know the talent is there and we know that there's opportunity to grow businesses and what better way to be an owner operator than doing it this way. In addition, we started a scholarship program a couple of years ago where, you know, we endowed that where we are giving scholarships to every participant, um, whether they're inside or outside, um, for their kids to go to trade school, boot camp, or college. And we've now had, um, I think it's 13 recipients so far. And it gets back to the idea of generational cycle. Like we want those kids not to go down that path. And it also, it creates huge respect. Like Give him choices. My, my mother or father is in prison, but they're working toward my success. That has huge impact. Yeah, that's incredible. It's powerful stuff. So this has been just an incredible journey. I've t we've taken so much of your time. Where do folks go? Obviously, we'll put everything in the show notes, but where do folks go to follow this prolific movement and also all the other things that you're doing? Yeah, um, thelastmile.org, thelastmile.org. Uh, we have a show on Sirius XM, um, The Last Mile Radio. Um, we actually have a site, thelastmileradio.org, where you can see all the episodes, and that's been kind of amazing. And we've been, I've been sitting in, in your guys' seat, which has is, is, is been fun, but it's also um, a way for us to you know, tell our story and we've had, you know, people like 50 Cent and Governor Holcomb and um, songwriter Linda Perry and and then a lot of our participants telling their journeys of redemption and, and transformation. So it's been it's been really fun. So people can listen to that. Um, and, you know, I, I think everybody can lean in. Part of it is everybody gets, you know, has a vote. So when things um, come up that are you know, criminal justice reform related, um, you have, you, everyone has a voice to change things. We've seen that a lot in California. We were part of Prop 36, which is three strikes reform back in 2012. Beverly and I were on that committee and we saw the impact of that. So people can lean in and you don't have to be as crazy as we are to start something this like this to, to be involved. Volunteer, get your company to acknowledge that, you know, hiring formerly incarcerated is, is a benefit. Have you seen the work that Michael Rubin and Robert yep. Kraft have reformed with Meek Mills and yep. Jay-Z? That's, sure. that's some impressive stuff too. Have. Yeah. We've, we've worked some with the uh, Reform Alliance. Yeah. We know them well. You know, I know Van Jones very well, Jessica Jackson. Yeah. You know, she was on our show. We know her very well. You know, we've known her for a while. So, you know, they've done a lot around bail reform. Um, a great group of people. Mike Novogratz yeah. is part of that as well. Yeah. So, you know, um, unfortunately, there are not enough of us. Yeah. 
but it's growing. The idea of, of reform has happened over the last 10 years, and we're hoping to see more of that in the future. We never thought this would be a life mission for us, but it has. We've had over 1,200 people through the program. We have over 500 that are out you know, prospering today. Our recidivism rate is, recidivism rate is less than 1%. That's incredible. So, you know, it's working and, um, you know, we're passionate about it. You know, like it comes back to the, you know, as we started, like we're all in on this. Like this is something that we do now every day. Your life has been a series of last miles. It has. It's incredible. Um, and, uh, this was beyond anything I could have expected for our podcast. So. No show. Thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. And be sure to check out everything in the show notes. Um, definitely frequent some of those sites, folks, because clearly there's some big stuff happening here and you can just be a part of all of it. Thank you for listening to Ford Obsessed. Please share this episode, subscribe, and leave a review on your podcast app. This episode was hosted by Pete Senna and David Salinas from the Digital Surgeons Podcast Studio in New Haven, Connecticut. Special thanks to our AV crew, Steve Walter and Meg Olson. Forward Obsessed is produced by Robert Roach. If you'd like to contact our team, visit us at forwardobsessed.com.